So this, uh, I want to say this is sort of uh, something that started actually uh, at the end of the last uh, uh, ZK-proof uh, workshop. Actually, Ron Kennedy is the one who uh, initialized this discussion. And um, this is sort of a joint effort that's gone over, uh, over a year. And I should say a lot of progress happened, I would say, within the last uh, two, three months since uh, a group of us discussed this at, uh, uh, at uh, Darkstool. So let me first just sort of say the list of people who, have, who were involved in, uh, uh, in this effort. Uh, it's uh, Ran from uh, Boston University, Jan Kamenish from Definity, Ran Cohen from Northeastern, Dennis Hoffheinz from Karlsruhe, Markov from uh, University of Edinburgh, Mary Maller, who's here from uh, UC London, Alessandra Scafuro from North Carolina State University, Bjorn Tuckman from IBM, uh, myself from University of Rochester, and Vasilis from, again, University of uh, uh, Edinburgh. As much as uh, I want to say we have put one year of effort uh, on and off on this, uh, I'm still going to say this is like towards a zero knowledge ideal functionality. Uh, I should still say we are not yet uh, in, I, I won't say it's still like a stable uh, form. But we've definitely made progress, and this is something that I want to share uh, during the next uh, you know, 30, 35 minutes. And again, a huge, huge disclaimer, this is uh, uh, work, in, uh, work in progress. And you know, my presentation is also going to be quite a bit of like a bumpy ride. All right, so let me start with um, zero knowledge proofs. And you know, we've heard enough and enough amount of, of uh, zero knowledge in this, um, in this workshop. But I still want to, again, start with uh, a definition of zero knowledge proofs, as this is going to be uh, important in this discussion of why do we care about having a zero knowledge ideal functionality. Okay, So zero knowledge proofs. We know the definition of zero knowledge proofs. It says that you know, for every efficient uh, uh, verifier, there is an efficient simulator who sort of can uh, achieve the same goal. And to be a little more formal you know, in, uh, in crypto and in complexity theory, what does efficient mean? This means probabilistic polynomial time uh, Turing machines. OK. So, um, this is sort of a pictorial view of what exactly happens. I'm giving sort of the interactive version of uh, zero knowledge. It says that for every verifier interacting with a prover, I want to say that the proof conveys zero knowledge if there is a simulator who sort of can generate the same view of this verifier without knowledge of anything else, just the mere knowledge that the statement was valid. Okay, and this, uh, I mean, beyond this beautiful concept of zero knowledge proofs and you know, what we have today, uh, I want to say that this definition is also sort of the cornerstone of definitions of security in, uh, in cryptography. It gave this notion of uh, a simulation, which sort of is trying to capture the fact that the messages that were exchanged, say, in the protocol carry zero knowledge. I mean, to even like, I mean, knowledge is something that's very hard to capture. And here it is sort of, um, oh God, it's, uh, I think it's on some timer. Sorry about that. Um, here it is about defining zero knowledge without quite defining what knowledge means. Okay? And the other aspect of this, this definition is about uh, the fact that is the, is the definition is the introduction of what a simulation means. And this is, again, you know, going to be uh, a theme in what we're going to talk about here. It's going to also help us define what does it mean to compose uh, security notions. Okay? So this is the definition that you know, we all study when we look at zero knowledge proofs. This is the first definition that we, we study. But you know, this definition that we have actually is in the classic standalone model. We are talking about a single prover, a single verifier, and you know, we are talking about this, this isolated interaction and what happens in this isolated interaction. Okay? It's one instance, one set of parties executing one instance of uh, some uh, security system. Okay? But our world really isn't this. right? We have tons of cryptocurrencies, tons of zero knowledge applications, tons of people working on uh, interacting simultaneously uh, in uh, several interactions. Right? And you know, 
you, when you want to model adversaries, what are you thinking about here is someone that could, in fact, participate in multiple interactions with the goal of you know, targeting one of them using the other interactions that are happening in the space. Okay? And of course, we want a definition that's also going to capture what happens in the real world. You want to capture the attacks that are going on in the real world. You want a good definition. And at the same time, I also want to say that this should not necessarily make things more complicated for us. Right? It, there was nothing wrong in uh, uh, defining security, security in an isolated way. In, and somehow, uh, what I want to convey here is that the goal here is we want some security definition that will allow us to analyze it in a local way, but still guarantee some sort of global properties. This is a good goal. If we can have such a security definition, then it's not like we need to worry about all these interactions that are going there. When I come up with my own nice zero knowledge system, I can just analyze it locally and still say, look, you put it in the, out in the real world, it's still going to be OK. And here, I'm going to give uh, an example, which I am sure most of you have, uh, have seen. But I, I want to say that this sort of illustrates why um, this sort of um, concurrency in executions uh, uh, you know, give us trouble. So this is the classic chess master problem, which is you know, I, uh, I am someone. I have actually zero knowledge of, uh, of chess, but I still want to sort of you know, satisfy my uh, ego and win against um, grandmasters. So at 8 in the morning, I, uh, you know, I, I say, OK, you know, I'm going to, um, I'm going to play chess with uh, uh, Grandmaster Yale. I don't know if Yale is there. She was hallu hallu hallucinating yesterday with Amit, but uh, OK, never mind. Um, so let's say that I am uh, interacting with Grandmaster Yale. And of course, I don't know anything about uh, chess, and I'm going to lose in this game. So disappointed, I'm going to go again in the evening and you know, pick someone else. Uh, I'm going to play with Grandmaster Aviv. And of course, I'm going to lose again. right? But now I, I, I come up with a, with a devious strategy. I'm still not satisfied. My ego is not satisfied. The next day, what I'm going to do is I'm going to arrange so that I talk to, I, I play chess with both of them simultaneously. And as you can all expect, I'm going to copy the moves. You know, I'm going to uh, uh, arrange it so that I'm going to schedule it so that you know, I'm the white player in one and the black player in the other. And you know, I copy the moves. And what happens is that, of course, either I'm going to win one of these games, or I'm going to draw both. Okay? And uh, what sort of is illustrated over here is that individually, the chess game was secure with respect to me. I couldn't break it. But the moment I could do this, you know, uh, I could schedule it in such a way the security is, uh, is broken. Isolated, it was fine. But you know, when you were running a couple of instances, things go bad. Okay? And sort of the key things that are happening here is that things are happening concurrently. Because both these games are played, you know, I'm able to uh, have both of them at the same time. There is a, there's a thing about scheduling that I can pass on the, uh, the moves from one board uh, to the other. And also, I'm leveraging the fact that you know, the two grandmasters actually are unaware of each other. These are sort of like three points that highlight what happens in the real world. When you are interacting with your computer, logging onto your bank, or doing something, you, are, you don't know what else is happening. You know, a lot of things are happening, but you don't know. Okay, and you still want security in uh, such a setting. Well, this was just a game. I mean, uh, in protocols, you can think of this. You you have also again heard about person in the middle attacks, right? Like you have uh, Alice sending a message uh, to some person. This is like mauled in some way and sent to Bob. And then when Bob responds, you know, you sort of maul again and uh, play with Alice. And this the situation again, as what I was telling, is that. It could be that in isolation, each of these protocols were secure. But the moment you put them together, these security properties need not hold. Okay. And of course, this is something that we know a lot. And this is uh, referred to as uh, a malleability uh, attack. Now, let's ask about composition of uh, zero knowledge proofs. Now, there are, when you're running zero knowledge proofs, now you can think of many, many forms of uh, uh, of composition, and I'm going to sort of take you a little bit through history. Initially, like what people thought about is like parallel composition. And parallel composition is about running 
in parallel, but you know, there is some restriction on scheduling. It doesn't happen that you can, it has to run in lockstep when you repeat it in parallel. This has consequences in terms of like soundness amplification and so forth, but this was sort of the first context where people cared about repeating zero knowledge uh, uh, in parallel, but you can also think of concurrent composition where you know, these messages itself need not go in lockstep. And of course, the question is, do zero knowledge protocols stay, you know, the security property hold even in such a concurrent setting? And um, the answer is at least when, you know, initially when this was all found, even, you know, repeating it twice in parallel is no longer secure. And you need to make sure that your definitions and your constructions will, you know, cater to these situations when you want to repeat them uh, in parallel. And there was a long line of works, and the, in fact, during my PhD, and you know, a lot of my doctoral work was also about analyzing these uh, zero-knowledge protocols, and I should be specific here, these are the classic interactive variants and not the non-interactive variants. Some of these problems uh, alleviate when it becomes non-interactive, but others get exacerbated. But the, the point is that you know, people have studied composition of zero knowledge. There have been plenty, plenty, plenty of works. There are works that talk about parallel composition, concurrent composition, then, you know, protecting against malleability attacks. These are called non-malleable zero knowledge, where you can have a verifier in between acting with the prover on one side and a verifier on the other, okay? And you can think of putting both these together. What if I have both many, many sessions uh, in both, you know, as a prover as well as, as, a, as, a, as a verifier? And these are called concurrent non-malleability attacks. And I, I should say, if you are inclined to doing theory, there are still nice uh, theoretical questions that are uh, open uh, in this space. But what is common sort of uh, in all these things is trying to come up with a definition first that captures these attacks, like concurrent attack, concurrency attacks, non-malleability attacks, and then coming up with a zero-knowledge proof system that will satisfy this, uh, this definition. And this is sort of have been quite a bit of our traditional thinking. And well, the pros, of course, are that you know, these capture these specific attacks in these specific uh, scenarios, and they are relatively simple. But of course, the, the problem is that you know, now every time an attack comes, I need to model this scenario, and then I need to come up with a definition, and then a construction that uh, meets this, uh, this sort of uh, an attack. It's not quite modular in the way that at least we all love to do in cryptography. It's about we do want to have you know, something that protects against all polynomial time adversaries, like all attacks. We want a nice modular way to analyze our zero knowledge while at the same time guarantee security against all realistic uh, attacks, okay? So in, in some sense, the, I'm going to sort of list some security desiderata that one would like about uh, such security systems. So your, your definition or your model should you know, faithfully represent realistic attacks, timing attacks, or uh, I don't know, like you know, padding attacks, so forth. It should be able to capture like concurrency attack, realistic attacks. You should be able to specify the security concerns of your protocol. What do you want to hide? What is correctness? I mean, these are sort of specific guarantees that you want of your, um, your system. And the guarantee should remain meaningful in sort of any environment this is run in, right? As I said, you are going to be unaware of things that are happening out there and you still want to make sure that what you are running is going to be secure in arbitrary environments. And you want your definition, of course, you want it to be modular and um, simplify the analytic process and to be a little more um, uh, specific here, the point I want to make again is that I should still, you know, I should still have the luxury of analyzing my zero knowledge locally. Like just talk about my protocol and rather not worry about what else is running there, but still get the feature that even if things were running out there, it's all good, okay? One would, I mean, I, I know that I'm writing a desiderata and you, one could ask, can we really even achieve all these goals uh, uh, meaningfully? But these are desirable things of a security notion. And of course, you want to provide uh, meaningful uh, security. 
So before I go into, there is a formulation that, you know, uh, with the hopes of ca capturing the security desiderata that I'm going to uh, talk about. But the first thing is like, do we really care? Okay, do we really care about these attacks? Maybe they're just like pathological attacks, right? I mean, maybe the systems that we have are like, are okay. So here, I'm gonna give you an example. None of us in this room, know, like we understand zero knowledge, even if we understood zero knowledge in the most basic level, we are not going to do, we will not be vulnerable to this attack. But still, I sort of want to illustrate what's happening here, right? You can have, like, you know, we saw all these range proofs. What if there is a situation where, you know, the prover is asked, you know, prove your number is between zero and 100. And then, you know, you get this proof. After some time, you're like, huh, can you tell me if it's between 50 and 100? And then you keep going on like this, and you see where I am going. Now, your zero knowledge might be the best zero knowledge. It could be concurrent, non-malleable, whatever. Like, it could be the best zero knowledge. But when you see this situation, your zero knowledge is not helping what's happening here. Your value is not going to be protected uh, uh, in this thing. So now, a, a little more, uh, 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 another example that's close to heart that I sort of want to say over here is uh, the Zcash um, cryptocurrency uh, example. At least the initial, I don't know what's the state right now, and this is not meant to be a criticism on uh, anything, just to sort of illustrate a point over here that you, zero knowledge is a means to an end towards securing some larger system. In this case, for the Zcash cryptocurrency, it was about confidential transactions. And they had a beautiful zero knowledge system and you know, it was proven secure, so forth. Barring again, of course, what happened recently with Ariel Gabizon, I'm gonna ignore that, but still, you know, it was a beautiful zero knowledge system that guaranteed what you wanted. But when they deployed the system, they said, let's have both. So that you know, we are still consistent with sort of the Bitcoin framework, but also provide this luxury of confidential transactions to, to who care, who, who care about being uh, confidential, which is, which is nice, you do want to provide this as a feature and not force it on the people. But the simple attack here is that even though, you, because you did this, transactions could in fact, in some situations be linkable. If money moved from a transparent address to a shielded address and immediately moved to, uh, from the shielded address to uh, a transparent address, now it does turn out to become linkable. Now, uh, the point here is that the zero knowledge was fine. It was just that, I mean, one should think about zero knowledge in the larger context as what is the means to the end, to what goal you want to, uh, want to achieve. And uh, as much as I am pointing this out as an example of you know, these things, this is hard. Okay, this question is hard. You, I, I, I cannot even tell you today, okay, can you give me sort of an ideal goal for uh, confidential transactions? And I don't have an answer to that. But one important component towards that goal is to come up with a modular way of describing, defining security of zero knowledge. Because once I have this, then I can modularly use it in other system and analyze security of uh, other systems. And the effort that we have taken so far is towards this goal. So now I'm going to actually talk about, you know, I, I listed all this um, uh, security uh, desiderata. I'm going to talk about one of the, like, you know, most common, most popular approaches to capture this security desiderata, and it's called this universal composability due to uh, Kennedy. I didn't put the, put the reference here because I'm assuming it's ubiquitous, uh, and Ran is right there. All right, so the, I'm going to tell, I'm going to try to explain this, and uh, maybe it'll get a little technical, but I'm going to try my best to explain what is this uh, UC approach, okay? What is the idea? And the idea is that, you know, you, you, the security of your system is, some, is defined or is reflected only on its effect on the rest of your system or the rest of this uh, environment. And this is something that you want to capture uh, in this approach. So to capture this desired security of some particular system P, first what you're going to do is you're going to write an ideal system of what you would like, okay? This is my ideal goal. And here you're going to already, by specifying the ideal system, you're already going to say, these are going to be the side effects of my protocol. 
Okay, whatever it is, and you need to be happy with this thing. So when you specify this ideal system, you want to be careful, you want to say what you want to hide, what you want to guarantee, okay? And then you, your particular system, is you're going to say is a realization or is secure for this uh, ideal system if it looks the same for any external environment, okay? The idea is that you're thinking of two different worlds. In one world, you have the ideal system where you're happy with the situation, this is what I want. And in the real world, you have the real system, which is the system P, and how it affects or how it talks to this environment should look the same. And the idea is that since you're happy with this, since you prove that these two interact or you know, have the same side effects or the same limitations in terms of side effects to the environment, it means that your protocol P is going to be secure for F, okay? So this is what this UC approach is trying to uh, capture, okay? That to show that the, the side effects remain sort of the same. So I'm gonna have sort of a pictorial representation of what uh, I mean by this UC approach over here. So running a protocol Pi in a concurrent setting or in some environment that you care about, you want to say it's as correct and as private as your ideal system, which you can say computing F or computing your zero knowledge, you can define your uh, zero knowledge as an ideal goal. You want to say that running the protocol pi in an arbitrary concurrent setting is as correct and as private as computing the same functionality with a trusted party. Okay, in the same concurrent setting. This is what you want to capture, and pictorially what this means is that, let's say that uh, you, know, you have this person in the middle talking to two people with the protocol pi. Uh, the, the definition I'm saying here generalizes beyond zero knowledge also for multi-party computation, but for the purposes of this talk, you can think of what's happening there is uh, zero knowledge. So you have a person in the middle talking to two people let's say they are you know, interacting via uh, zero knowledge, and you have an arbitrary concurrent setting. There are other protocols executing uh, concurrently. This is what is, happens in the real world, and you want this to be as correct and as private as in an ideal world where there is a trusted party that does everything for you, okay? So when you specify here, as I said, you know, the first step towards doing this thing is specifying an ideal goal. I'm going to get into how do you specify this ideal goal for zero knowledge in a minute. But the point is that you want to show that whatever is happening in the real world where a single person is acting with many people in zero knowledge in the presence of arbitrary connections is as correct and as private as each of these executions that you are running having an ideal service that is doing exactly what you want, okay? So slightly more uh, formally, the definition of UC security says that for every adversary in the real world that is interacting in multiple, say, interactions via zero knowledge and in the presence of like arbitrary things, there exists a simulator that can achieve the same goal in the ideal system. Or in other words, whatever side effects your protocol is going to do in the real world on the rest of the environment can be simulated by an ideal uh, party here in the ideal environment can do the same sort of side effects, okay? And I say, as I said before, since you already specified that you know, this, I am happy with this ideal system, I have an ideal party for each of my interactions that you know, all these malleability attacks can't happen because you know, these are independent ideal trusted parties that are doing for each execution, I should be good, okay? So for every adversary, I need to demonstrate that there is a simulator such that these two worlds have the same side effects, okay? And how do you uh, model this side effect? You're going to say that, you know, uh, whatever is running concurrently over there, you're going to actually capture it. Oops. Um, as another party that you think of as an adversary running like uh, concurrent things over here. And you want to say that for every adversary, 
there is a simulator that can, just like in zero knowledge, as I said, that you know, it can simulate the view of the adversary, this simulator can actually, whatever side effect this adversary is doing on or is influenced by this environment can be captured by the simulator in the ideal world. And this should hold for all environments. Okay, no matter what is running, I don't know what's running out there, but I still want my real world to be as correct and as private as the ideal world. I know I'm doing this pictorially, but you know you should go look at uh, Kennedy's uh, the UC framework. All of this is uh, mathematically modeled. Of course, there are you know contentions, subtleties, and all these things, but you know this is this is nevertheless formally modeled. Okay. So for every adversary, I need a simulator that demonstrates that my real world is as correct and as private, no matter what the environment is. Okay, and this is the definition of uh, UC security. And of course, just like we said in zero knowledge, you want both of these uh, adversaries to be uh, probabilistic polynomial time. You want both of them to be efficient because you want to say that uh, it's not that an adversary in the real world gets some additional power uh, because the simulator becomes more powerful. If you didn't get that remark, it's fine, but this is sort of important when you want to capture knowledge or you want to capture what is the side effects of your uh, protocol. Great, so we had a security desiderata, and you know, uh, actually one can show that this actually captures the things that uh, we care about. And it also gives us this benefit that now I can just analyze this actually in isolation. I just can say that, look, uh, even the two executions, I can push one to the environment and just uh, analyze one locally. And I can still say that since it is secure against any environment, it's going to be fine, okay? So this is great. We have a, a really nice definition. This sort of encompasses like all the meaningful attacks that we care about, and this is called UC security. So what's the state of affairs for uh, UC security? And you know, soon after this was found, or even in, uh, concurrently, this is impossible. Okay, this definition is just too hard to, uh, uh, to, uh, to achieve. And in fact, uh, the UC setting does in fact capture um, most of the attacks, all of the attacks that we care about, but this impossibility result holds even if we make some restrictions in the concurrent setting, okay? So it's not just something that you know, we really strengthened and it was a problem, but you know, this is something that is inherently an issue when you want to argue such security. I will ignore that, that's sort of a technical, um, technical comment. So great, we have this definition, so what do we do now? And let me tell you, this is something that we already encountered with zero knowledge, okay? Like you cannot have a non-interactive zero knowledge system in the plane model, okay? You need structured reference string, common random string, or you need like random oracle. You need something to, to get non-interactive uh, zero knowledge. We already had a similar problem. Yes, we, we like non-interactive zero knowledge. The interactive variant can be based on standard assumptions. One-way functions are enough. But when you suddenly ask, I want non-interactive zero knowledge, now this is not going to be possible in the plane vanilla model. And Similarly, with the UC security, this is what happened. To get around this impossibility result, we're going to take some limited trusted help, okay? And here, there is, again, there were a lot of works in this area trying to get UC security uh, in the 2000s, and you know, a lot of my, again, PhD research was on understanding what kind of models, uh, what kind of limited trusted help will allow you to get uh, uh, UC security. And there are many things, like you can, if you make an assumption that you know, the, the adversary corrupts a, a minority of the people, or the one that we all love, like for zero knowledge, which is common reference string, or there are like, if you make some timing assumptions, tamper-proof hardware, key registration sort of uh, functionality, these limited trusted help, if we can assume, now we can regain and prove uh, UC security. And as much as I say this, one needs to be worried about what is the effect of this trusted help. Okay, in some cases, this is benign, like you know, in common reference string, I just set it up once and then I'm done. Okay, 
one needs to set this common reference string up carefully, and we all know like setup ceremonies that have been done for uh, the Zcash, so forth, but once it's done, we are all fine, okay? So this is sort of some limited trusted help that uh, we can use to get uh, UC security. Right, so uh, the, what Yuval is bringing up is that uh, even when you use this, like the effects of the common reference string reduces some of the properties that we naturally have with zero knowledge, such as uh, deniability. And here, you need something stronger than UC security, which is called like this global UC security, which handles common reference string in a way that also tries to preserve uh, deniability in, uh, in zero knowledge. And uh, this is absolutely right. Like, I mean, yes, we are using this limited trusted help, but it does sort of compromise some aspects of uh, what we get out of uh, zero knowledge. So there are also like other ways of getting around this thing where I said, you know, for every adversary, there is uh, every polynomial time adversary, there is a polynomial time uh, uh, simulator. Uh, 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 you can relax this by saying that I have a super polynomial time simulator. And again, this also has uh, effects to what happens uh, to your security. It sort of says that for every polynomial time adversary in the real world, in the ideal world, it has some super polynomial um, power, okay? And for some situations, this might be fine. For some situations, this uh, might not be, uh, be fine. All right. So, this is sort of the state of UC security. Now, what I sort of want to do is, uh, actually, the road gets harder uh, from here. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to tell first, let's just take the vanilla zero knowledge functionality. Let's not worry about non-interactivity. Let's not worry about being succinct, so forth. How is it modeled in the, in the UC framework, okay? And then I'm going to edit it to make it uh, useful for non-interactive zero knowledge. This is going to give some complications. Then we are going to go to snarks, which is where this is what we want to uh, achieve, and things get harder as we go from one model uh, to another. And how many minutes do I have? Ah, oh, six minutes. Okay, good. Um, all right, so the vanilla zero knowledge functionality, let's see what happens in the real world. I'm doing this slightly out of order. You want to say the ideal world and then this is the, the real world, but I'm going to go the other way. So you have an environment that is typically Z. If you look at any crypto papers, that's the symbol that they use. You have Sorry, you have the prover, you have the verifier. So how is the system initialized in the UC framework? The environment gives the inputs to the prover and the verifier. So you know, there is some identifier for you know, the execution. You give the statement and the witness to the prover and only the statement to the, uh, to the verifier. And then the prover and the verifier interact with each other and then the verifier is convinced and the verifier can relay back to the environment whether it was convinced or not. Okay, so this, this is what happens in the real world, and the side effects is what I'm going to say is what happens, you know, to uh, the, the environment. And here, I might lose you folks a little bit, but the point is that either the prover can be malicious or the verifier can be malicious. These both uh, make sense. When the prover is malicious, you care about it actually having a witness for the statement. The verifier being malicious, it's trying to learn more. Okay, and the way you want to think about it is that the environment and the adversary are sort of colluding, okay? Now, the point is that in the standard zero knowledge, the way I said it was that the simulator can simulate all these messages without knowing the witness. So if the, if the verifier is sort of malicious, the side effect of this protocol are these messages that are exchanged, okay? And since zero knowledge has a simulator, you can simulate these, uh, these messages. What I'm saying is inaccurate in, in, in many levels, but the, F, the point is that you want a simulator that can simulate the same sort of uh, uh, side effects over here. But what's more interesting that we care about here is what is the ideal functionality over here, and the ideal functionality is something like this. You have um, this ideal system that's going to do this zero knowledge functionality to you. The prover gives, um, you know, the X and the witness to the ideal functionality. The ideal functionality is going to do everything you care about, okay? It's going to check if X comma W is in the relation, meaning it satisfies, and then just convey that information to the verifier and nothing more. It gives X and 
what is the uh, the membership of this in the uh, in the uh, in the relation okay so now i want to say what happens uh, in the in the non interactive zero knowledge world well now you have to incorporate a common reference string or you have to incorporate the random oracle i'm going to sort of talk about this in the common reference string model you can do it in the random oracle and i'll sort of say why we didn't do that and i'm going to restrict myself to the common reference string model so here you have the the environment giving you know x comma w to the prover and you know uh, the non-interactive zero knowledge, as you've all said, you lose deniability. So in some sense, you and in other in other words, if you care about public verifiability, then you sort of lose uh, this deniability. So the prover actually has to give back the proof to the environment. The proof is something that the environment does see. Okay, it is a side effect of your uh, protocol. And but this is not what happens. You actually need this common reference string. There is a common reference string that is generated. The prover generates a proof, and it gives to uh, the environment. With with this non-interactive zero knowledge, we don't need to see the prover and the verifier at the same time. Okay, it's sort of publicly verifiable. So I can treat the case of the prover and verifier sort of in uh, in, in different uh, in different settings. Okay, so here I'm only talking about what happens with uh, the the prover. Okay, so now let's talk about what happens in the with the um, in the in the non-interactive zero knowledge functionality. Well, the prover. Uh, remember, I should sort of have the same effect that happens over here. Okay, to the uh, to the environment, and if you recall in the zero knowledge functionality, the prover just gave you know everything to the functionality, and the functionality did what I. Uh, what uh, I, I needed. But here, when it comes to non-interactive zero knowledge, there is a side effect. This proof is made available. And this non-interactive zero knowledge functionality needs to give the proof to the prover that, so that it can relay it back to the environment. Otherwise, your real world and ideal world are not going to look the same. Okay. So what happens is that there is a simulator that actually, um, sorry, not yet. But so in this case, um, the, the NIZK functionality first sort of records this x comma w. It keeps it in, in store. You will see why uh, we need this. And um, it's going to the simulator to get a proof, OK? Because the simulator would simulate the common reference string. In some cases, you don't need to. But here, I'm sort of assuming that the simulator can, will simulate the common reference string and can generate a proof for any string. And the simulator needs to generate this proof without looking at the witness. Okay, and that's what's captured here, which is relayed back to the, sorry, which is relayed back to the prover and back to the uh, environment. So already you see, yes. Is this a generalized that, that's still vanilla. This is well, no, no, this is vanilla. You see, right? Okay. Good. So then let's look at what happens with the with the verifier. I treated the uh, the uh, the prover first. Now in the verifier's case, the verifier gets x comma proof. And the verifier needs to uh, verify it. It just gives zero or one. You know, it can locally. It has the verification circuit. It verifies and gives it gives the response back to the uh, environment. Now, in the ideal world, it gives this proof to the uh, the uh, non-interactive zero knowledge functionality. Now, there are two cases actually here. One case is that this x is already recorded in the NIZK functionality. This actually corresponds to when an honest prover generated a proof like using x comma w, gave it to the NIZK functionality and got the proof. This would be recorded, as I mentioned uh, in that slide. In this case, you know, the functionality will just, uh, uh, you know, it identifies this and then it gives back the response to the, to the verifier. But now you need to worry about a second case where the proof was maliciously generated. Okay, you don't know how it was generated, and it was maliciously generated. And the point here, uh, Daniel, it can take like two minutes, is it? Okay. Um, when the proof is maliciously generated, it will not be recorded in uh, in the NIZK functionality. Okay. And now, the before uh, the NIZK functionality tells zero or one to the verifier, it better know whether this was generated correctly. Is there a witness corresponding to this statement? 
Okay? And in the case of non-interactive zero knowledge, at least this can be done by, again, giving you know, this, the common reference string x and pi to the simulator. And the simulator from the proof will be able to extract the witness and give to the functionality, which, is, which can then check if the relation holds and goes back. And here, I want to say that the simulator is able to extract this witness. And in standard NIZK, this is possible. When you go to the snark world, you'll see this is where the complications uh, arise. Okay, you want it to be an argument of knowledge, but the simulator cannot necessarily just extract a witness. But in this case, it can because the proof can be long. We are not making any restrictions on uh, the proof length. Okay, so this is uh, the, uh, the NI, NIZK functionality. And in the interest of time, I'm going to quickly sort of say that what are the complications that come uh, in the snark land uh, is that, first of all, we know you know, succinct arguments, you know, with adaptive soundness, this is impossible from falsifiable assumptions. We don't know how to do it. And, you know, the solutions get around it by making knowledge assumptions, random oracle, fiat shamir. And, you know, based on the discussion, I don't know if you were in the assumptions uh, yesterday, this also is like a big field of, you know, a lot of uh, uh, confusion that one needs to resolve. But, you know, things get hard in the snark land. And just very quickly, standard simulation says for every adversary there is a simulator. But when you go to the UC land and you know, when you want a modular proof, you actually say there exists a simulator for all adversaries. Or in, in the UC setting, it's, there is a simulator for all environments that can uh, have the same uh, effect. Now, there is a result due to Bitansky et al. that says that you know, this, if you want this kind of a modular definition, it is impossible. Okay? You cannot get snarks with this definition. So, you know, there are knowledge assumptions that, again, try to get around this by defining auxiliary information in some way. Again, there is a lot of contention in this space. But from a theoretical standpoint, again, we have one sort of stable definition, which sort of says, for every polynomial time adversary, there is a simulator that is slightly larger than this adversary that can simulate it. This is not compatible with UC, but this is a definition that sort of circumvents the known lower bounds that, uh, that we have. And our goal, at least from this ideal functionality business, was to capture uh, this thing. Given that I'm running out of time, I'm going to skip this slide, which is about extending the UC model to something called the angel model, where the simulator gets some additional help while you do this, um, uh, which this help is something that both the simulator and the adversary in the real and the ideal world get this. And you, this, Angel can be much larger, can be super polynomial time, can be, you know, this is a limited help you're getting from some uh, party that is going to still allow you to do composition, okay? You're, you're going to be able to still do composition because both the real and the ideal world have access to this, to this angel. So what we have done so far, sorry that I'm running out of time, that um, we have come up with a formulation where this simulator has access to an angel that will help you extract the witness, okay? roughly speaking. But you know, there is going to be a document uh, which is going to talk about how this happens. I, since I'm running out of time, I'm just going to put this slide here which says that, well, the simulator will not be able to extract the witness because the simulator is defined before the environment. Okay? So you cannot satisfy this definition. But by introducing an angel, you get this additional help that can be larger than the environment and help you extract the witness. And this is necessary, first. And second, it also helps us circumvent the known impossibility uh, results. So let me sort of just put this uh, one slide and um, uh, tell you that our goal, at least in this, uh, in this whole thing about getting an ideal functionality, was two things. One is that you know, we want to define an ideal functionality towards a goal, to be useful in applications. So uh, one sanity check for us would be like, or not sanity check, a benchmark would be, once we define this functionality, let's come up with an ideal system for confidential transactions and show how to use zero knowledge to achieve that goal. And at the same time, we want this zero knowledge functionality to be realized by the snarks that we know, okay? And this is sort of where we are. And again, I want to say that it's not yet, it's fine that you didn't see what was the actual construction because you know, it's still undergoing uh, a, a lot of change. But this is sort of what we are, uh, we are trying to do. And uh, I won't, let me, oh yeah, sorry. 
let me uh, let me uh, stop with that and uh, thanks